This I'll, conference I'll will now be recorded. <laughs> Thank you, Pam, and I appreciate your efforts in putting this session together. It looks like just a tremendous panel of uh, participants and also in the audience. We just appreciate everyone taking their Friday to join in and uh, hear about some of the uh, women's concerns, issues, perspectives, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it myself. And I just, um, I, I just want to recognize, you know, our Vice President Beverly Kuhn, who's also co-moderating. And um, just want to point out Alyssa Reynolds Rodriguez is one of the panelists, and she's the current international president. And I've known Alyssa since she was the student chapter president at Montana State University oh, maybe 20, 21 or so years ago, <laughs> about the year I was international president. So, you know, like I was saying uh, before we got started, once you volunteer for ITE and you, you become an officer, a committee chair, whatever, it's just, it's so invigorating and so appreciated, I think, by the membership that you stay involved, you find opportunities, to use your own skills and talents. And uh, it's just great to, to, to keep involved even after you retire <laughs> and move to another state and start a whole new life. Uh, ITE is the constant there. So I wanna, I wanna go ahead and uh, get the panel started. And our first panel member is Tracy Lehman. She's a transportation engineer with Kimley Horn uh, out of the Atlanta office. So Tracy, please share some, some of your perspectives with us. Absolutely, thank you, Jenny. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. It's exciting to get everyone together and, and see everyone as well. Um, I really started my career in transportation. Um, I, I, it, it came about in a really weird way. Um, all through high school, you know, everyone um, around me had meant I had a lot of mentors and uh, just advocates through high school that said, "Oh, you you really like math and science. You really like math and science. You should go to Georgia Tech. You should go to Georgia Tech." Um, but I was really involved in music, and so I was going to go to UGA and I was going to be a band director. And um, I talked to one of my friends that graduated just before me, and he said, you know, it's really easy to switch into music, but it's really difficult to switch into Georgia Tech and to switch into engineering. And so why don't you start there? And then if you want to do music, you can go, you can always go switch and, and do that. And it really spoke to me in that um, I, I knew I loved music and had a passion for it, but it wasn't necessarily something that I wanted to uh, maybe have as my career. I wanted to still preserve the love for music um, and have that opportunity to do something else. And so I, I ended up saying, OK, great. Well, I'm going to go to Georgia Tech and uh, I guess I'll study physics. Um, so I really started in the physics program um, at Tech and, and did that. But my roommate um, or my my roommate, my second year of college, she uh, was a civil engineering major. And she said, I don't want to do this at all. But Tracy, everything you talk about, I think you would love civil engineering and you should look into transportation. And so she's really the reason why I explored civil engineering and, and found my way to transportation because I came in uh, to Georgia Tech as a physics major. I missed all of the intro to engineering classes that really tell you like what are the different types of engineering and what might you want to pursue. And a lot of the guidance as well, um, they have a lot of programs set up for engineering general majors, um, but I didn't have that opportunity because I came in as a physics major. And so luckily I had a friend that really knew me well enough to push me in that right direction. And as a child, I had a father that every trip we went on explained to me how the interstate system was set up and told me that uh, north-south roads <laughs> are, are um, are uh, odd numbered and east west roads are, are even numbered and we had that conversation on every road trip um, so i think the two of those combined are really what brought me into transportation and the thing that's really kept me here is the interaction um, that we do i work really on the planning side of transportation um, more preliminary engineering and coming up with ideas and concepts and that um, opportunity to interact with people has really been what's um, caught me 
kept me in transportation when I first, you know, got into the profession and worked in the field. Um, so as I said, I graduated from Georgia Tech. That was about 13 years ago. I uh, decided to move to Florida right out of school, height of the recession. It was great. Everything tanked. And uh, I ended up then taking an opportunity in, uh, in, sh in Chicago um, in order to stay employed, which I thought was really important. <laughs> I moved up to Chicago. Um, got a lot of different exposure there, and then I've made my way back to um, working at Kimley Horn and uh, being back in Atlanta, which has been really a great move for me and, and, and opened up a lot of opportunities. Um, one of the things that I enjoy most about the transportation profession is the amount of variety that we get. Um, and I've seen that both through my career and then just day to day um, when we're serving clients and having the opportunity to interact with the public. There's a lot of different variety that come in that. And that's what really draws me to the field and that I think is the most interesting um, about it um, and just keeps me engaged. I've worked in both private and public sector transportation. So I've done everything from a traffic inter a traffic you know, impact study to um, I do a lot of VISM modeling. I do travel demand modeling and get into those nitty to get gritty details and sometimes wonder to myself why I didn't become a computer programmer. Um, but I love all of that. Um, and with that, I, I just love the variety that comes in and how all of it interplays together, um, especially when we're making planning decisions. If we're making a decision about what something should be for the long term, having a great understanding and background in what all the different aspects are and how they fit together really grounds the decisions that you're making and the plans that you're developing. Um, and it just to me, that's really exciting and the most interesting piece of it. I also have developed a passion for safety over the years and have had the opportunity to be supported um, within Kimley Horn and being provided opportunities to grow that um, and, and engage with practice builders doing safety work and build a safety practice um, for me in the Southeast. And for me, uh, just knowing that I can make a difference in the work that I'm doing and have an impact um, and sometimes a really fast impact where we can go out and just recently we identified that some pedestrian clearance intervals were incorrect along at an intersection. And when the city looked into it more, they realized like the entire corridor through their city that the intervals may may not have been correct. And so just the little things like that where you're like, oh, wow, like if I'm working on a long term planning project, it may never be constructed <laughs> ever. But this they went out and they fixed it. And now all of the timings are changed. And so those kinds of things and that different variety of thinking long term, but also thinking short term and how we can improve things. That's really what drives me in the profession. And, and those are some of the things that I think are most exciting. Um, and in terms of my goals for where I where I want my career to go, um, one of the things that I'm also really passionate about is just training others. And so for me, that's always kind of my goal in the back end of I'd like to just let everyone and 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 engage with those that are younger than me and help grow them. That's something that really inspires me and, and, and no matter which way it is. And so for me, that's really something that I want in my career is just the ability to continue to be able to do that. And I'm able to do that sometimes through ITE and taking on positions where I'm able to um, help facilitate things to move forward. And then sometimes that's at work um, or working on a project team. And so those are the different things for me. Um, and I don't think anybody on this call knows this, um, but I am currently expecting my first child in June. And so there are a lot of things related to that that I'm thinking about now. And it really has changed kind of, well, you know, what do I want to do and what's my focus in my career and, and how does that work with my family life as well? And so um, we're really excited about that opportunity and moving forward and um, excited to hear from everyone else today and uh, just get this group engaged in talking. So thank you. Thank you, Tracy. And um, yeah, we should do a, a, another session on how to balance family, <laughs> your career and ITE. That's a that's a challenge, but you know, you just kind of put one foot forward in front of the other and then you wake up like me someday and you're retired and your kids have left home and there's a big echo in the house and you wonder what's next, but it, it's all good. So just know that you're, you're on the right path. But, Thank you for sharing. So next we have Shilpa Malam, and Shilpa is from the Portland area where she works for HDR. So Shilpa, if you'd please share with us your perspective. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you, Jenny, and thank you for having me here today. Uh, 
Uh, as Jenny mentioned, uh, I'm with HDR in the Portland office. Um, my journey to transportation has maybe been a little more traditional. Um, my, I grew up in India, so I did my undergraduation in civil engineering in India. And my dad was my dad was a professor in statistics, so we we're already in the science field. And science and math always made sense to me. You had set answers. It, it wasn't any gray areas like the other subjects, so I always liked them a lot. So engineering was kind of, uh, I had a natural inclination to take engineering once I got to college, um, but I wasn't really sure what kind of engineering. Um, so I started with civil engineering. The college is a little different uh, in India where you, you pick your major going in. Uh, so I took all the classes in civil engineering, but I still didn't have a clue of what I was going to do until I guess junior year, which is the third year, is when we had our transportation classes. We had geometric design, we had traffic, and it just clicked. And right away after the class, I said, "This, this is what I want to do um, as for my career, or this is the, this is the way I want to go." And um, so my senior project was in traffic, um, travel time, and delay. And I ended up applying to master's program and I applied a bunch of different places and I got accepted um, a, few, uh, a few universities here in the US, but also the University of Delaware. And that was my mom's choice because I had like one cousin in the US who was close by and she said, that's where you're going. So, which was still a great school. So that worked out for me too. So I got my master's there and was lucky enough to start working immediately in Delaware um, and I had great set of mentors. Uh, my two bosses uh, there had a tremendous amount of experience and uh, right away, starting out of the bat, I think within a month or two, I was in public meetings and working groups, which is completely different from what you learn in school is just numbers and geometric design. So that gave me a really good perspective on how everything we do impacts how much of an impact it has on everyday life so that just puts a different perspective it's not just what you're doing sitting in the office but the real-time impact um, impacts uh, so i really like that portion of it interacting with the public with the working groups uh modifying the design there were two long corridor projects i worked on um to modifying the design even though it's not what you thought it would be in the beginning you had to come to a consensus to come up with something that was feasible to be built uh, and i was also lucky to work on not just geometric design but also a lot of traffic projects the small projects uh, like tracy mentioned some of the planning projects you might not ever see or maybe it'll take you 20 years to see them but the traffic projects everyday traffic projects are the ones that you can see they have a quick turnaround the safety projects and you see the impacts too especially when you do the before and after studies and it's very satisfying to know that what you worked on had a difference in real in real life um so uh that that is the that is what I really like about the profession and also the fact that no two projects or no two locations are the same. You have to think differently for each location um, and that keeps it interesting. It, I don't like monotony, so it's, it's good to have different challenges at different locations um, and that's what keeps me going every day. Uh, what else said? Uh, my goals for my career, um, I would, want to continue and ha I work on projects that I that are more meaningful um, make an impact in society and not just projects but also uh, work and foster an environment that's inclusive um, just based on my experiences and experiences that I've heard from others um, uh, just make sure that we uh, we work towards a healthy environment that listens to all voices um, so we can provide transportation solutions that apply to everybody in, in our community. That's all I have today. Thank you. Thank you, Shilpa. Um, I'm, I'll throw in another comment. Um, so uh, my husband and I lived in Denver before we moved to Phoenix 35 years ago, and he worked on their light rail system never passed, never passed the referendum. So we moved to Phoenix where we thought 
we could <laughs> build light rail. And um, in the meantime, Denver passes referendum, builds their first line, adds on twice. And he was uh, fortunate enough to get the Phoenix system up and running by 2008, cut the ribbon, added on a few extensions, and just retired last month. So he did get to see both systems come to fruition. And, and now he's kind of looking around the country for more light rail to build somewhere. <laughs> That's we'll great. So I had a similar story where, so I was in the East Coast until two years ago is when I moved to Portland. And there was this project in Delaware, the US 301 that I worked on since I came out of school. I worked on the geometry side as well as the tra traffic portion of it. And mm -hmm. I moved here in December of um, 2018. I think the construction started in January of 2019. So I need to go back there and actually see yes. the project next time. So yeah. And, and you know, I think that's why a lot of us went into engineering or related field. We like to see the the physical results of what we've worked on, what we went to school for. We can drive down the street and say, oh, I helped in that design or I helped in that building of that facility. And to me, that was very rewarding of, for my career. But thanks again. Let's move on. And we have Persephone Oliver, who's with Econolite. And Persephone, if you can share where all you've traveled to around the country, around the world, I'm sure it's a very interesting career you have, but take it away. All right, well, thank you. And first, I do want to thank Pam and ITE for including me to be on this panel with all of these uh, lady leaders in our industry. Um, it is a pleasure and an honor. My story is really, I'm listening to these and I'm not a traffic engineer, so my story is a little bit different than what you've heard so far. Um, and I am the Vice President of Marketing for Econolite. This November, I will celebrate my 30th year at Econolite. Um, and hopefully you all know who Econolite is. We have been in business since 1933. So we were established just three years after ITE was founded in 1930. Just a little tidbit of information that I realized this morning, so I thought I'd share that with you. But Econolite, uh, we basically the one-stop shop for traffic management, everything from system software, sensors, cabinets, controllers, pretty much everything that departments of transportation need at the intersection. Um, we, and then it goes further. So we're, we're in that part of the industry. We're also in consulting for connected and automated vehicles. Um, how did I get here? So I'd like to say that as a little girl, I grew up dreaming about being in traffic management. That really wouldn't be the truth though. Um, uh, but I think that's because I didn't know then what I know now. And I can wholeheartedly say today that I ended up in the right profession, in the right industry, and definitely at the right company. Um, who wouldn't wanna work for a company that is making such a difference by, by improving our roadways, safety on our roadways and genuinely saving lives. Um, but how did I get here? So I'm gonna take you back quickly about 29, a little over 29 years. Um, my high school senior year, summer vacation, and I wanted to have a summer job. Turned out that lucky for me, my aunt was the vice president of human resources for Econolite, who, by the way, retired from Econolite after 40 years in the industry and with Econolite. So it kind of runs in my blood. Um, but she said, you know, our receptionist is leaving. She's going to travel for the summer. That position's open. So I took it and um, I fell in love. I fell in love with the people. I fell in love with the company. I f definitely fell in love with the mission of the company. Um, and you know, I was 18, so I thought, uh, wow, I have a really important job here because I was the first person that people saw when they went to Econolite. I was the first person they talked to. So I felt pretty important and I loved the job. But summer ended, I went back to school graduated, and the first thing I did was ran back to Econolite looking for a job. 
Lucky for me, uh, the receptionist decided not to come back from her travels and go back to Econolite. So that position was still open. I took it. And then I took every opportunity that came my way after that to really learn the business and learn the industry. Um, I spent time in human resources in inside sales. I was an assistant to a few of the vice presidents. And then one day the owner, Mr. Mike Doyle, who I think is an icon in our industry and a wonderful mentor, offered me the position as his executive admin. Um, so I took the job. And the first thing he did was encourage me to go back to school. He said, you need to get your degree. You need your bachelor's degree. You need your master's degree. So I did that. And then not long after that, he gave me the opportunity to build a marketing department from ground up. Um, the company really didn't have a marketing department at that time. Hard to believe since we've been in business since 1933. But marketing had been handled by actually by engineering. Uh, so I built the, the marketing team, the department, and that is where I am today. That's where I've been for about 20 of my almost 30 years at Econolite. Um, it's been great. If I think about where is my journey going to take me next in the industry, um, I'm really having fun. I think I still have a lot to give to Econolite and to the industry. And, you know, despite the pandemic, I have seen so much... Um, so our, our industry changing so much, evolving, and with you know, connected and autonomous vehicles, smart cities, uh, big data, um, and all of these other emerging technologies. So I think it's a really exciting time to be in this industry, and I think I'm going to stay around a little bit longer. That's my story. Oh, and Jenny, you had asked about travel. So through my position in marketing, I have been able to do quite a bit of traveling, um, mostly for all of the different uh, exhibits and, and um, meetings that are, are, let's see, we had one in, um, let's see, gosh, there's France, there was Beijing, uh, Switzerland. I think ITE actually went, was it Sweden or Switzerland? one year. Um, but yeah, being in marketing has given me the opportunity to be to do quite a bit of travel uh, business related. So that's been wonderful. And I, I hope to keep keep that as a part of the, my next journey also. Well, we certainly appreciate Econolite support of ITE functions, whether it's a local conference or a district meeting or the international I, Econolite is always there. We we really sincerely appreciate the support you give us. So yeah. I, I know um, someone that was uh, the Phoenix rep when I was a traffic engineer there for 30 years was Jerry Fonda. He was one of the very first people I met when I moved to Phoenix 35 yeah. years ago and was just a, a super guy and really represented Econolite well. We just love their products. So thank you for Welcome. sharing. With you. Thank you yes. very much. Thank you. Okay, the next person I've known for, oh, all of what, maybe eight years? <laughs> Krista Purser uh, with Kittleson in the Portland area was someone I met uh, at Cal Poly, which is where I am today, actually, in San Luis Obispo. And um, she was just a superstar as a student. She helped organize the very first Student Leadership Summit in 2014 and has graduated has gone on to be now a superstar with her career and she's uh she's just great and i just i just love being associated with krista and i follow her career now she doesn't know it but yes i i stalk her every chance i get so <laughs> krista could you please share with us um your experiences and your fresh perspective thank you well, thank you for that introduction, Jenny. Um, hi, I'm Krista Purser. I got a little intro to where I am now. Um, I think kind of where I came from and how I got into transportation sounds like a mash of some of the things that have been said so far. Uh, definitely liked math and science growing up and really enjoyed. Um, my grandfather was a carpenter and I thought it was so cool that he could point out the different houses he had worked on uh, when we went and visited them. So 
Um, definitely had an interest in the built environment and had that math and science interest, knew nothing about engineering. Uh, so my biology teacher in high school actually recommended I attend an engineering um, kind of workshop over the summer for high school students. Uh, and I just loved it. And I think throughout my whole journey, I'll point out nearly everyone that made those really big encouragements along the way were women. So it was my female biology teacher and it just really cemented to me that there's a really high need uh, for women in, in STEM careers. But loved the engineering work, decided that was what I wanted to do uh, in what I wanted to study in college. Um, at the time I thought structural engineering because buildings and that's, that's something that I thought was cool. Um, but as I started getting into my coursework at Cal Poly, I just really didn't feel that interested in the, that structural side. Um, but I had a very passionate professor who did the introduction to uh, transportation class. Um, I probably looked very tired. I was an RA at the time and remembered popping into her office and it was an 8 a.m. class and I was like, hey, I really like this. She goes, oh, you look so bored in class. <laughs> so, <laughs> Like, I didn't know you liked this. Here, you should go to the ITE meetings. Um, you should talk to Kaylin Roseman. Um, she's the president and she'll she'll get you involved. So she uh, looped me into ITE and then Kaylin kind of looped me into the Student Leadership Summit. So it was my, my first introduction into the ITE world and the transportation world. Um, but just really enjoyed how encouraging, how passionate uh, the professionals I was meeting were, how passionate the fellow students were, um, and just the range of different things you can do in transportation. And it's um, it's not just sitting at a desk and it's not just being good at math and science. Um, and it had a lot of different challenges and ways I could, I could see myself um, learning and growing throughout my career. Uh, so during my time in school, I had met a few folks who came into our ITE meeting, introduced themselves from Kittleson and uh, interned in our Boise office. Again, just loved the work we were doing. Um, I'm very much more a consultant at heart. I love to pop in and help communities that have been waiting for, um, waiting for that outside assistance, waiting for that technical expertise. And it's always rewarding working with them and working with the different communities that I get to see. Um, so I, I came back to Kittleson in the Portland office after graduating and I've been here for almost five years now. Um, I do a big range of work, so some of your traditional um, longer range transportation planning, uh, shorter range conceptual design and operations work, um, final design I've done before, not so much now. Um, and then the, the really big ones for me are transit planning. Um, there's some new and dedicated funding in Oregon that's really helped out a lot of smaller communities. So uh, we are talking the ruralist of rural, um, we call it, a lot of them operate mostly lifeline routes and they truly are lifeline routes. Uh, a lot of our rural agencies haven't seen any decrease uh, during the pandemic. Um, people are relying on those things for groceries, for medical, uh, and their needs don't stop. Uh, so it's been a busy and interesting time, um, but nice to, be able to just jump in and, and figure out what the, that community needs, what that client needs, um, and try to build something that works for everybody. Um, so that's it's kind of the big picture there. Um, I work with a lot of different staff. I probably have 10 or 15 um, projects going on in time and really enjoy building up the staff that I've started to oversee in the last couple of years. Um, and see their passion and interest growing uh, within the IT world. I do like to jump into things like this, um, talk to students, get them involved and passionate about it. Uh, also involved with our sustainability standing committee, um, which is a nice way to push forward a lot of different initiatives. Uh, really looking forward to the equity listening sessions that we're holding this year. But I think that's kind of everything for me. Well, and then how many times did you help Cal Poly win the International Traffic Bowl for students? Because I know there for several years in a row, Cal Poly was the first place winner and you were always on their team and you were always the one right there answering all the questions. So that was <laughs> that was well noticed. And if you think the people in the audience are just being entertained, no, they're looking at the up and coming students who are going to 
be the superstars in the profession like you. So thank you for all you've done for ITE in such a short time. I appreciate it. And our next speaker, let's move on to Karen Robles, who's a director of transportation for the village of Schaumburg, Illinois. Schaumburg is a, a sub, suburb of the Chicago area. So I'm sure she's encountered a lot of uh, exciting, challenging work over her career. So let's hear from Karen. Thank you. Thanks so much. So yes, I have spent my career in municipal transportation planning. Um, I am one who fell into the transportation industry. It wasn't, wasn't part of the plan. Um, I come from a long women um, who've been very involved in politics. My grandmother was a mayor. My mom is a retired state rep. And so I loved government work, but I hated politics. Parades are not for me. Going door to door was horrific. And so I figured out that I wanted to be on the business side of government. So I actually went to school for public administration, uh, thinking I was going to get into city administration, become a city manager. Um, and so I went to Miami of Ohio, uh, enrolled in the public administration program, loved it. Um, realized in conversations with my dad that he had caught on that I was maybe completing my coursework a little faster than uh, anticipated. And when he brought up graduating early, I picked up a second major <laughs> and, uh, and went into urban and regional planning because there was a lot of course overlap. I wouldn't have to stay at school any longer, but there was a lot of synergy between the two. Uh, so when I graduated with um, both of my majors, it was uh, post September 11th and similar to Tracy's story, it was take whatever job you could get. And so I interviewed with the city of Bloomington, Indiana. I actually interviewed for two positions um, and the way the process worked was you were either gonna be the long range planner or the transportation planner. And I would have happily taken either job, but was actually thrilled to get the transportation planning position. Uh, in that role, I was able to serve as the transportation planner for the city, but I also was staff for the regional MPO and so had had good exposure. Um, you know, one of the reasons I love transportation planning is because we actually get to implement the things we work on and long range planning is is great, but it's a lot of documents on shelves that are are good plans, but not always followed through on for a variety of reasons. And so um, once I got into transportation planning, I knew that's where my heart was. It's new. It, it's where I want to be for the, the length of my career. So I spent two years in Bloomington and then had an opportunity to move to Carmel, Indiana, focusing more on multimodal transportation. They had a councilman who was a huge bicyclist and he advocated for a position to really increase that multimodal presence within the community. Uh, so I spent two years there really focusing on bicycle, pedestrian and transit initiatives. And then um, got engaged. My fiance was back up in Chicago where I'm from. So I moved up to Naperville, Illinois, where I took on um, transportation planning from a little bit different perspective. It was still a lot of the multimodal and some of the roadway planning, but I also took on um, commuter parking. I got involved in development planning from a transportation perspective and was able to broaden my perspectives that way. Uh, and then about seven years ago, I had the opportunity to come to Schaumburg, Illinois, as their director of transportation, where um, I now manage an airport and uh, hella stop. So that that was, um, I was very candid in my interview that when they said, you know, what's your biggest challenge going to be? I was like, I, I know nothing about aviation. I, um, I fly in airplanes to travel. That was about the extent of it. And so now I joke that um, I'm going to have to move somewhere with a port so I can just round out my portfolio. Uh, and I think that's one of the things I've enjoyed most about transportation is that um, there is never a dull moment. If you're willing to just jump in and say yes, then, you know, your opportunities are endless. You know, I, I didn't seek out to manage an, an airport, a general aviation airport, but I'm doing it. I'm shockingly involved in the aviation community now. I, I like it. Uh, I don't know that I want my whole career to be dedicated to aviation, but it, it's an opportunity I never envisioned myself having and I'm really enjoying it. Uh, as far as the, the public agency perspective goes, I've, you know, I have true to my, my plans, I've loved working for government. I like that I get to work on projects from like initial conception, preliminary studies, um, all the way through to construction or implementation. 
Um, I get to interact firsthand with the residents whose lives I'm impacting. You know, I get the calls um, from the people who use our transit programs and who say it, it is allowing them to get to the doctor's office when, you know, they don't have other transportation. We just uh, provided transportation to our mass vaccination clinics. And so, um, you know, it's a really rewarding um, aspect of my career. Um, and then I think in terms of goals for my career, it's, I'm open. I think that's the, the one of the things I've taken away from my career to date is that um, I want to stay engaged on a, a local and regional level, but I want to get involved in projects that are um, groundbreaking and innovative and, and solving those transportation issues that, that we all know exist and that, and that should be addressed. And so, um, you know, I like the public sector. I'm not opposed to the private sector. I think there's a lot of things out there that the private sector can do that maybe we're a little bit um, hamstrung on on the uh, public side. But for me, it's just about what's the next challenge, what's the next opportunity to kind of take that leap into the, the future of transportation. So I think that about sums it up. That sounds that sounds very exciting. And I, I worked for the public sector for 31 years, I, I can relate to all those exciting, challenging projects and working with the public. It's also its own challenge. And I, I think we'll hear from our next speaker who couldn't agree more, um, President Rodriguez <laughs> or Alyssa as we know her. Um, she's she's had a great career as well. And I've followed her since, again, she was student chapter president at Montana State University some 21, 22 years ago. And she's just uh, she's just been so impressive and I'm so proud of her. And uh, between her and I, uh, she calls me her ITE mom. So that's a, a wonderful title that I cherish. So Alyssa, could you please, this is probably what your 50th uh, virtual meeting this week. So <laughs> thank you for joining us and fitting us into your schedule. But we're so excited to hear from you this morning or this afternoon where you are. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks, mom. I mean, Jenny. <laughs> and yes, this is something like my 50th presentation this week, but that's part of the part of the job. And I am so honored and thrilled to be able to do that. Um, you know, it really is a privilege. Um, as I've heard all of the other presentations this morning, I'm really struck by all the similarities. You know, some of the, you know, we've all taken a different career path, but there's a lot of parallels. And I think that's one of the things I've loved about ITE is we kind of get stuck in our day to day. And you, you think like, this is only my problem. I'm the only one that's dealing with this and I'm really struggling with it. And uh, you stop and think, no, I can reach out to my ITE network and I know there's somebody that is dealing with and that somebody is, is can help me. And not only that, they're all willing to help me. So it's just been such a, such a valuable network. Um, I also started my career as a receptionist. <laughs> Um, I was working for a construction company where my dad was the accountant. Um, my first tasks were making popcorn and filing. Um, I ultimately moved on to doing the payroll for the company and we were doing payroll on a giant mainframe computer that had um, boxes of backup disks that were like this big and I had to do that twice a week. Um, but we also transitioned into personal computing uh, while I was there. And there was this amazing woman that I worked with, her name was Lois Thomas, um, and she did not have a high school degree. She um, didn't finish high school. She did ultimately get her GED, but she was amazing. She did all of the um, uh, accounts payable, accounts receivable. She taught herself um, personal computing and networking and actually transitioned us from the mainframe system into the personal computer system and set up the entire network for the office. So um, just such an amazing role model. She's incredible. Um, I think that that opportunity in construction really is what drove me to um, take a take a to look at engineering when I was in college. I did start as an architect, but I didn't like that it was so subjective at all. I, I know my final project, I got an A um, from one reviewer and a D from another reviewer, and that made zero sense to me. So 
quickly switched to civil engineering for my second semester and I, I've never looked back. I did sort of fall into the transportation realm also. Uh, a friend of mine was working at a research facility and they had an opening and they paid a lot more money than what I was making at my other position on campus. And so I switched over and quickly I was doing things like scrambling up the mountainside in California to do speed studies for these um, speed feedback signs that they had just installed. And then I was traveling the next weekend to rural Montana to hand out uh, surveys for their rest areas. So I, I just love the, the flexibility of that and all the different opportunities and all the different directions that I could go. Um, I also love the creativity that um, in transportation, things just aren't black and white. There's a lot of gray area in the middle and you need to find a, the uh, application that works best for the situation that you're in. Um, my career has been a little bit of the lemony snicket <laughs> approach, so maybe the opposite of lemony snicket. It's been a series of fortunate events. Uh, I, when I was in consulting, I got an opportunity to le learn travel demand modeling software TransCAD, which is built on a GIS platform. And so when we took on some GIS projects, it just naturally translated and I was able to teach myself um, ArcGIS. And then when I moved to the public sector, we were just kicking off an effort to do some um, asset management work. And we were adopting a piece of software that again was GIS based. And since I had that background, plus the transportation background, and I was just starting to learn the maintenance side as well, um, I was pulled into that group and had a huge opportunity to, to set up our maintenance management software which also ultimately saved my job during the economic downturn because I was the lowest on the totem pole as the engineers. And um, so I got, uh, during the reduction in force, I got, I got booted out, but I, I got to stay as the uh, system administrator for our software and kept my job. Um, ultimately moved to be a, a traffic engineer for a city in North Las Vegas and then come back to the city of Henderson as their traffic engineer. And all of that background, the GIS, construction experience, maintenance it's experience, when we started working on smart cities applications, it just made sense to me, um, especially with the uh, additional software background. And ultimately, here I am as the Director of Information Technology. I'm not really sure how that all happened, but I think it's, you know, this, that, that building of all the experiences that led to, led to this point. Uh, looking into the future, um, I too am a big believer in, you know, you take your opportunities when they come up. So I'm not sure what's on the horizon next. Um, I think there's some potential to move into the city, city manager's role, uh, maybe as an assistant city manager or something like that. Um, I also, I, I love technology and I love the application of technology. And so my dream job would be to um, consult with companies that have a, have an application or an idea and then to use my expertise to apply it to the real world and, and how we actually um, construct things and operate things in the transportation system. Um, I, I also, ITE is my other job. <laughs> I probably spend just as much time on ITE. And um, having someone like Jenny as your role model uh, is is just is just huge. So when I when I was thinking about running for this office, it, you need a platform so you can communicate the why to to the voters. And probably the most impactful thing for me in ITE was just how welcome it was. And there were people like Jenny, who are president of the organization, and they come to your student chapter, visit you for a, a couple days, and then the next time they see you, they remember your name. And I'm like, I'm just a lowly student, and Jenny remembers my name. It's so amazing. And so thinking about that, my platform was to give that back to the organization. You know, ITE has been a, a family for me, and I want everyone to be able to have that experience. And so that was my platform. And that really has transitioned into things um, to an even bigger picture, uh, things like diversity, inclusion, and now this equity effort. And so if I can give just a little bit back of that, not only to the organization in ITE, but to the community at large, um, um, I will be very pleased. I, I feel like my job is, I, I'm not an expert in those fields, but I have a position where I can make sure that those conversations keep happening um, and, 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 and continue to happen and that we really take action as transportation professionals. So we'll see where, what comes up next. Thanks, Jenny.
Well, thank you for the kind words, Alyssa. And, you know, we have a, a lot to accomplish with our new uh, mountain district. So I'm sure there's a spot for you after you uh, finish the international circuit. We'll welcome you back into the new mountain district and find a good spot for you. And technology will be at the top of, of our list. <laughs> So thanks so much. And it's a, just a joy to hear of your career, how you've progressed and balanced with ITE at the same time. Thank you so much. Um, we have one more speaker, another Alyssa. And Alyssa Ryan is a PhD candidate at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And I guess, um, does that mean you're a Dr. Ryan or your soon to be Dr. Ryan? Hopefully soon. <laughs> Yay! Well, we wish you all the best, and uh, we're just happy to hear from you, and be, and we're happy that you're part of this panel today. So please uh, take it away. Great, thank you so much. So as Jenny mentioned, yes, uh, I'm a PhD candidate at UMass in civil engineering right now. I've been at UMass through my undergrad and my master's degree as well, and I'm technically still working as a visiting research scholar at the Technical University of Munich in Germany. I just moved back from Germany on Monday. So uh, working virtually through there till June, just because the pandemic, I had to hop back over to the States early um, and getting vaccinated since, which is really exciting. So yes, I started out uh, at UMass in my undergrad in civil engineering, not because I thought I wanted to be a civil engineer. Um, I guess my story is kind of similar to Tracy's. I was really into theater, really into music in middle school and high school. But I knew I didn't really want to go that uh, route in my undergrad as it felt really risky, <laughs> um, according to kind of how my family viewed, viewed that field of work. So I thought I'd be a great hobby, but I still want to you know, have that creativity in my future position. So I was set on architectural engineering because I thought, oh, that's, that's a good combination of my math skills that I have and drawing and uh, that sort of creativity side of, of structures too. That's what I want to do. Turns out architectural engineering is not all that common of a degree field. I don't know how I found that type online, but in upstate New York and New England, there's like one program. So I decided, ah, oh, civil engineering is close enough. I'll try that out. And I applied to a bunch of schools um, because I graduated a year early from high school uh, just because I was getting kind of sick of high school. So I jumped out a bit early, didn't visit any schools and got some money from UMass. And so really that's why I ended up going there. Um, and I went there for my undergrad and I started out my first day of civil engineering thinking I was going to be a structural engineer, maybe still fit into being an architectural engineer someday, not quite sure. Um, but my first professor, my first civil engineering class was Dr. Michael Nodler, who has been quite heavily involved in IT. I'm sure some of you know him. And he, he spoke about all the types of civil engineering that you can go into but he was really into transportation and you can really tell, it's hard not to be biased when you're teaching an introduction civil engineering class, kind of what you do. Um, and I was really drawn to that. So he talked about how, you know, transportation impacts people and, and kind of the creativity of, of the field. And, you know, there isn't necessarily ever correct answer at any point in time. Um, it's always kind of moving and changing and structural engineers didn't seem to have that. There always was that right answer. Um, I'm sure that's not necessarily true, but that's how I viewed it at the time. Um, and so I was quite drawn to uh, transportation. I attended the ITE meetings my first year. Um, it was really cool to meet graduate students. I thought that was really exciting and um, seeing kind of work they do. And so I stuck with transportation and got involved in research pretty early on with Dr. Nodler, uh, which was fortunate um, to have him as a mentor because you know, he, he's very passionate about ITE and, and transportation research and safety work, which I really enjoyed working on. And so I worked on different projects throughout my undergraduate degree. I did a few internships at a VHB, um, some MPOs at the Volpe Center, trying to figure out, okay, what do I want to do? Do I want to work for the public sector? Do I want to work for the private sector? Where do I see my career going? Um, and I was really convinced after my second year in undergrad of engineering, I need to get out of here. This is too hard. I can't wait to graduate. I'm so tired. <laughs> I'm so sick of school. Um, and my third year rolls around and I start to consider getting a master's degree because I liked working with Mike so much. And, uh, you know, he offered that it could be a quite easy a path for me. And I also knew I wouldn't go back for a master's degree. That's not who I am. I wouldn't want to go back to school and study again. So I thought, heck, I'll get this out of the way now. Um, and during my master's degree, 
I did a research thesis and started to see more about what it means to do independent work and the freedom that offers you um, to kind of think of your own problems in transportation and go on and just solve them. Of course, funding is kind of tricky sometimes, but I was fortunate to be able to fund the projects I thought of. And I spoke to another mentor of mine, Dr. Alini Christopa, uh, a female um, transportation researcher and faculty member at UMass, and said, hey, how did you decide to go for a PhD? Uh, you know, it seems like a, a big decision. You don't get paid very much for several years. <laughs> Why would you do such a thing? Um, I was starting to think of doing it myself. And uh, she gave me good advice. And something that I do think about, and I don't know if this is the best advice to give to everyone, but you're never stuck somewhere. So she thought, OK, well, if I start the PhD program, and I hate it, and I hate it so much, you can leave. You can apply to other jobs. You're qualified. You have a bachelor's degree already or a master's degree already. You're not stuck. Um, and although it's kind of maybe rude to just leave a program, if it's not meant for you, then you should stay there. And I've carried that through on all of my big decisions, um, especially moving to Munich for um, you know eight months during a pandemic. That was a really big decision. I've never moved you know to a new country by myself before. Uh, but it was really rewarding, and I knew that, you know, if something goes wrong, I can always come back. So that type of thinking has allowed me to take on some things that I would have considered risky, if not knowing I could have backed out of them. And I understand that's a really privileged position to be in. Um, and I think, you know, not everyone gets those opportunities, but I'm fortunate to have them. And so what keeps me involved in transportation is certainly that creative um, aspect I love researching. I love mentoring new students. It's very rewarding to have see what ideas they come up with, um, and uh, you know what they find exciting is different than what I find exciting, which is fantastic. Um, and working with them. So uh, moving forward, right now I'm at that you know that switchover period as I'm graduating. Fingers crossed, quite, hopefully soon. I have it scheduled out um, for later this summer. I'm currently in the academic job market, so hopefully that goes pretty smoothly. It's going pretty well so far, and that's really where I see my career going um, in education and research. And I find it to be, yeah, a rewarding field. I don't know if it's necessarily where I'll stay forever, but I know right now that's what I find exciting um, most. So quite fortunate to be in the position to do, to do that. Um, yeah, so my career goals are supposed are still very open. I don't know if I define them because I almost feel as if I haven't started my career yet, though I also feel like I haven't done anything else except transportation my whole life. So um, yeah, I don't know if I have any specific goals other than continuing to do meaningful transportation work in the equity and safety realm. Thank you. And this is, a, it, and again, it's a great opportunity to be amongst so many, fem so many uh, fantastic female leaders in ITE. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. That's uh, that's quite the journey you've been on and all the best in getting your PhD. And that's a good segue to the uh, next moderator who already is a PhD and Dr. Kuhn has been a, a, a doctor for many years and done great things at uh, Texas A&M and College Station. And we just, uh, at TTI, we, we just know that that's one of the Go to places for research as well. And so, Dr. Kuhn, we're pleased to have you as here as a, a moderator and as the international vice president of ITE. And, and to have the president and international vice president all on the same panel, I think, is a, is a, a, a phenomenal historic history maker. <laughs> and thank you again for participating and I'm going to hand it over to you to ask some probing questions of these panelists. Thanks, great. I, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and this this has been a great panel. I do have actually have a couple of not so probing questions or not that have anything to do with work. So I think like Alyssa, if you listen, I've listened to everybody and everyone has so much, there's so much commonality across all of us that are here. We may not have necessarily started out thinking this was going to be our career, but this is where we found ourselves. And I find it interesting, the music tie. So um, Tracy, I had to ask you, I'm totally off script, but what was your instrument that you played? I, I play the trumpet. Mm -hmm. The trumpet, okay. 
And so, um, Alyssa Ryan, did you, I know some of you others are probably musicians. So Alyssa Ryan, what was your instrument of choice? Piano. Piano, okay. So I was a, a percussionist and I, much like Tracy, I was very good at it and all state musician three years. And I had a lot of people wanting me to go get um, music degrees. And my parents were like, mm, how are you gonna make a living at that? <laughs> and I didn't think I wanted to be a band director. So um, so I went into engineering as well. I just find it interesting. Um, there were, at the time that I was at A&M, there was a, the, or the band was, we had the marching band, if you know anything about A&M, which was a totally different thing, but we had a volunteer band and it was all people like us that decided we were going to do something else. It was just the, the most fun to be in that group. But um, I just find that interesting and you'll find, I'm sure everybody, I think Alyssa probably was, Alyssa Rodriguez was an, is a musician. A lot of us are, so I think it's finding interesting. The connection between music and science and technology. Um, one of the things that I kept continuing here was that we all enjoyed flexibility, creativity that goes with transportation. So we have three buckets of, well, actually four um, buckets of employer types on the on the panel. So we have public sector, private sector, academic, and industry. So I'm going to kind of go through, and those of you that might want to ask that question. So we have, if, if you were going to give some advice to an individual that's just starting out in their career, maybe, you know, joining ITE as a student or graduating and thinking about getting uh, their first job or changing jobs. So as Krista, I mean, Alyssa uh, Ryan said, she may not do academics forever. I found myself on the research side. I don't teach, but occasionally. So you, you just never know where your next job is going to be. So any of you want to kind of give a bit of advice of who would, what would you say to somebody who's either thinking about going to work in your type of employer or changing say from one to another what advice might you have so we'll let Alyssa rodriguez start we'll let the president start <laughs> and then i'll go I'll be, I'll, I'll, to I'll be quick because <laughs> i know everybody else has lots of great things to say um taking a page from jeff paniotti's book um if, if you're just starting out, just get a job. <laughs> and like, I thought Alyssa Ryan's advice was fantastic. You're not stuck there. If you don't like it, you can go do something else. There's always another opportunity. And that's really important to remember. Um, but for me, why do I love the public sector? Uh, it's definitely that component that I get to see the entire life cycle of a project from when a customer calls us up and says, hey, I've got an issue, I can't cross the street, to designing, constructing, operating, maintaining. I love that. I love working with all the different departments um, where we have a full um, police department and fire department, emergency management, utilities, facilities, fleet, you know, you don't get that kind of opportunities necessarily um, working in other places. And then, um, you know, just the, the things that we're, we're doing to help people, to directly help our residents. Uh, during the pandemic, we got a, a CARES Act funding and it had a very strict deadline on how to get it spent. And we put together a program in a week where we were directly distributing funding to our residents for utility assistance, housing assistance, and broadband assistance. Um, and the, the response to that from our public was just amazing. And I was so happy to be a part of that and really make a difference in people's lives. So I, I, sometimes the public sector is a little challenging. You know, we're, we're a little bit slow perhaps in adoption. Um, we can be very cautious. Um, we their funding is always an issue um but there's also ways to creatively deal with that so i feel like we've been pretty progressive with a lot of things we do um our transportation um technology is at the forefront of a lot of things same with our it infrastructure and it's just that we've been able to creatively leverage where we have to to get where we need to be so um i think that's it just real opportunity and the variety in the public sector is what i what draws me to it all right, thanks. Karen, do you have anything to add since you're in a different part of the world of the United States? Do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with everything Alyssa said, you know, that life cycle of projects. I think the other thing with the public sector is that because um, we do have so many different departments and so many different challenges, the opportunities are, are pretty endless because we can't just 
hire new staff, right? We have fixed budgets. We have um, only so much revenue that comes in. We have to have a balanced budget every year. And so, you know, over my career, I've done community development block grant planning that has nothing to do for the most part with transportation, but the person who managed it left and they said, you're a really good project manager. We want you to take it on. And so, um, again, not what I want to do with my career, but valuable skills learned in terms of grant management and working with federal agencies. And so um, I do think it's been unique in terms of the opportunities presented to work um, sort of adjacent to transportation is probably a great way to say it. All right, great. So I'm going to turn to Persephone. She's the industry rep on our group. So what are your thoughts about what you advice you would give somebody who's um, interested in pursuing a career in the on the industry side of things? Yeah, well, first of all, I really love what Alyssa said about not you're not stuck with what you may have started out with, because I think it's so important that you love what you do. Um, and so I think that the private sector, coming from where I come from, um, there's so many opportunities too. And one of the things that have, has kept me in the industry for almost 30 years is because I wake up every morning knowing that I'm working for a company that is truly making a difference. I mean, we're providing this technology that is saving lives ultimately. And so um, I think somebody new entering this industry not really sure about where they want to go. I think a company like Econolite is, is great to start because um, you really get to learn so many different aspects of the industry and just business in general. Like me, you heard my story. I started out as a receptionist, human resources, sales, um, and then the different, the different sectors of the industry we touch. So connected and automated vehicles, smart cities, and working with the departments of transportation, working with contractors, MPOs. So there's just so much diversity in what you can do in a privately held company that is a uh, solution provider. Thank you. So anyone from the private sector consulting side want to chime in and give their two cents? Or nickel. <laughs> I can jump in. Um, I think it I think it's more a question of uh, where do you want to work in, not public versus private. Uh, there's so many different factors that go into what you're choosing. So just getting to know that organization really well. Um, I, I mean, a lot of folks you can change mid-career, but a lot of students are very focused on um, you know us interviewing them and not them interviewing us. You know, I want you to be happy in the place you work, and I want you to have all of your questions answered and and know what you're getting into. So that can be anything from the technical side. Um, someone can do the same thing I do at a larger public agency, but smaller public agencies, you might have a different range of the types of work you might be doing. Um, maybe it's a company where they have a large office and a small office and just large offices don't work for you or small ones don't work for you so it's not even um not even like your experience at the same company would be the same in different locations so i think just getting to know uh, what that role is what your opportunities are and see if that aligns with your interests great and i can uh Yopa? really i just want to add one thing because mine's a completely different perspective because as an international student coming to grad school, you have no choice because um, public agencies, rule of thumb, I, I personally don't know, know of any who would hire somebody without a green card or a citizenship. So any, pretty much all international students would be looking at the private sector for the job. So I guess from a choice standpoint, it's different that you're stuck, but doesn't really mean you're stuck from a career standpoint. It's like Krista mentioned, it's um, you can, if you're doing an internship, you can use that to see if that company is the right fit for you. If um, if you're able to do the things that you want to do, that's a, that's a great testing time if you can get an internship to see if that, there are different areas in civil engineering and transportation that you may be interested in, um, and that's like a six month or a summer time that you can check and see if this is what I want to do long term. Uh, but also 
just during the interview process, uh, it might be trial and error. You're not stuck in one place. You can always move, but check and see if, if you want a small office or a bigger office, what the work culture is and what opportunities you get to see. Um, so yeah, just wanted to throw that out there. Great. That is a great point. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, I know in the in, where we work, it, it, since I work in a university environment, a large, you know, we don't have any issues with hiring um, international students. What we like to do get them involved as graduate students and and encourage them to stay. So, um, but that's a great point that you just brought up. All right, um, here's a great question. Actually, anyone else want to add that before I uh, before I post Jenny's question. Anyone else? I would, I would add one more one more piece and, and it kind of goes along. We keep going back to what Alyssa had said about her career or um, but take opportunities as they come. I think sometimes a lot of our younger staff, sometimes they say, oh, I only want to do this one thing um, and they get really focused on it and they um, you know, sometimes there's some tension there with, oh, they don't want to work on this project because it's not what they think it is. But, you know, I think a lot of us, and you've heard and from our stories, is you, you take an opportunity that's presented and you and you see how it goes and you learn something from it. And then there's different opportunities that come up. So if you're doing one thing now that by no means means that's what you're going to do for the next 50 years, you know, you can do um, all sorts of things and it will it will guide you and take you in all kinds of directions. And so just take opportunities as they present themselves and be really open minded about what's out there. But I also agree, you know, figure out which where that company fits, which office size you like and what type of work they do in general, because all of those things do really impact. Um, what what your experience is going to be there. So take that opportunity to really interview the people that you're going to be working with and understand what that may look like and how you may fit into that. Thanks, Tracy. All right. So for and this is an open question for anyone. So knowing what you know now at this stage in your career, what would you do differently? If anything. Mine's a really simple thing. Um, what would I have done? The only regret was not backpacking across Europe before I went to work full time. That's my one regret. <laughs> That's the one thing I do differently. I can jump in on this one. I think, um, you know, my my choices have gotten me where I am today, but I think one of the things that in hindsight held me back a little bit at the beginning of my career was being intimidated that I didn't have like all of the knowledge walking into like meetings or projects. And so I think I held back from contributing my my thoughts or perspectives because I felt like everyone else at the table had more knowledge or experience or a better education. Um, and so I, you know, I think that can be intimidating. I think that, you know, engineers are really technical people and and really smart. And I think also as a young person at the table and a young woman at the table, it can be really intimidating. And you know, I have valuable perspectives and are they always, you know, the right direction for the project? No, but I think it contributes to the conversation and, you know, 99% of the time results in a better outcome. And so I just encourage everyone and, and, you know, in hindsight, I wish I had spoken up more and been more confident in the contributions that I have to bring um, to everything I participate in. So that's, no, that's great insight. I think we probably have all seen ourselves doing that at some point. And the dynamics of the room always make a difference too, as to whether you feel comfortable. Anyone else want to give their input on that? I just want to add a point to what Karen just said, um, because I think that it's so important when you first enter the business world in general um, to find a good mentor. And I, I found my mentor a little bit later in my career, but the things that my mentor just pushed me to do that I wouldn't have even thought of doing on my own, um, to think about what more I could have done had I started earlier. And so I think that that's something important too for people just coming into the business world, regardless of what industry, find a good mentor. That's great. And, and one of the comments that Pam told the group earlier is that we will, IT will be focusing on mentorship during May. And so I know we're working hard with that and we probably all serve as mentors at our point, you know, at some point. 
Um, so I think that's a great, a great, um, great insight. Any other, any other thoughts on that? Any other oh, questions? I have quick. Um, just when I was starting engineering as a freshman, um, I did really, really well in high school, but I went to a high school graduating about 40 other people. So, you know, my perception of the world was, was quite small. Um, and I didn't do very well my first year and I was quite um, upset about it because I thought I couldn't succeed as an engineer, which I think happens to a lot of people. And that's a lot of reasons why people do not go into their second year because they think, well, clearly it's not for me, I'll go do something else. Luckily I stuck with it. And what I know now and what I wish I had known then is engineering and uh, transportation in general is less about being a quick thinker necessarily, which is what I think in education we, we value a lot, thinking quickly on your feet, knowing the right answer right away, when reflection and persistence and hard work is valued a lot when you actually start working. Um, and so I'm fortunate to have that in me and I, you know, I never gave up, but uh, quick wit doesn't necessarily get you the whole way. And it kind of feels that way when you first start out, um, when you're sitting next to people and they can raise their hand faster than you. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's just my two cents. Well, and I think you bring up a great point and it, it ties back to everything we've talked about today in that the collaborative process is very important in what we do because we're serving our communities. In the end, we're doing something to make their lives better, whether it's you know getting, getting home quicker, saving a life, just you know getting them to the grocery store or the doctor or vaccines. I mean, there's just so many, we are an integral part of society and you can't solve that problem in a vacuum. You need to talk to the other parties, other stakeholders, and it's a very collaborative process. And it's not always quick and to come to, to arrive at the best answer, because there's not always necessarily a right answer. It's the best answer that we can come up with, given everything we knew. So I think that's very, very important. Um, so uh, Vanitha, one of our audience members has asked the question, so how do mentorship programs power, handle power dynamics? She said she had the situation where her manager and she were in the same program and you know there were some feelings of intimidation and invisibility. Does anybody have in their organization a formal mentorship program that might be able to have some insights in how you handle that power dynamic? I guess I, we don't, okay, somewhat. Oh. <laughs> I was doing the faculty 15 seconds. Still seems like to speak. Tracy, go ahead. Okay, um, I was just going to say, uh, I'm not, I, I know Kimley Horn has some formal mentorship pro programs, but they're not necessarily set up where someone at, you know, the same level would be in the same program. But I, I mean, I think what I would, what I would say is, um, if there's another opportunity for you to seek out a mentor that's not, you know, maybe with your company or within your company, but not part of that mentorship program that's really structured, that would be a great um, thing for you if that's an opportunity. And I'm sure any one of us on the call today would be happy to help find someone to mentor you or um, mentor you ourselves. Um, so that's all I was going to say is just there, it doesn't have to be, um, I think the mentorship that we're all talking about or that we've participated and we've probably both participated in formal and informal. And I think it doesn't necessarily have to be as part of a very specific program that's set up. It, it can be as simple as finding someone and, and grabbing coffee with them on a regular basis and asking for their advice and, and support. So I think um, just let us know how we can help support you in that. And, and I'm sorry that it didn't work out with the one that you were formally involved with. Great answer. Can I, thought? Yeah, I was just going to add to that is, um, so I was part of a couple of different mentoring programs. And I think the one thing to remember is it's good to have multiple mentors and also multiple mentees. Um, so I was part of the WTS mentoring program in DC and usually the mentoring programs that I've been involved with kind of run through one year and the next year you can apply again, get a different person. And WTS, was, I know this is WTS, not IT, but we're trying to set it up again in Portland, try to get WTS mentoring started again in Portland. And this is definitely one of the things we're talking about, but it, you i think when people do the matching they try to get the best match in but i i 
it doesn't always have to work out. Sometimes it just doesn't work out, but hopefully people are not giving up on the mentoring process. It's just that one connection that didn't go or meet the, all the expectations that we have. Uh, but the next, the next time you sign up for the program or the next year you sign up for the program might be the person. And like Tracy said, it might not even have to be a formal mentoring program. If you notice somebody or see somebody who you think is where you want to be and if they're nice enough to just get a cup of coffee with you, uh, it can be an informal. It's it's all based on personal relationships um, and how people click together. So it's uh, unfortunately it's not like click and done and everything works out. Um, so hopefully you're not discouraged by that and still look out for other programs or connections from a mentoring standpoint. Yes, Miss Jenny. Well. Miss Beverly, uh, so um, I did uh, the WTS mentor program in the Phoenix area, and then I took all that format and applied it to my staff at the city of Phoenix. So when I was a deputy director over our street maintenance division, how glamorous is that? Uh, but I had 300 street workers out there filling the potholes who knew nothing about professional development. And I tell you, I, I used this year long program for a couple of different years, let them pick their mentor. And actually some of them picked their own dads because they had done that same street maintenance job that they had seen growing up. And uh, so again, if they didn't pick their own mentor, I matched them with someone who had similar goals. That was part of their application was what do, what do you want to get out of this program? So it was so successful. They, I, I was just amazed how they ate it up. And they said no one in their uh, management line before had ever taken an interest in their professional development. And so after I retired, they made that program citywide through the city of Phoenix. So it was, it was re rewarding. And I helped ITE set up their online mentor program as well. If you've participated in that, there's an international program and it's all online. It's a either a one-time session or you can make it as long as you want. So, so I've had a mentee that was at the Florida International University. She graduated, went back to Bangladesh and uh, she's interested in starting a new chapter in Bangladesh. So uh, I, I don't know how successful we'll be, but we'll sure try. <laughs> but yeah, that, that mentor program, and it works both ways. You know, I had plenty of mentors, um, again, diff for different, either official or non-official, but, you know, it really helped me. You can't do it alone, that's for sure. Thanks, Jenny. Anyone else want to add in? I have one more question I was going to ask as we close in on the end of our time. But any other thoughts on mentoring? All right. So I did want to have kind of a blanket question for everyone. And um, so are any, you know, are any of you active in councils or committees? Um, because one of the things that we're, you know, that, that comes with being a member of IT is access to a lot of the resources that are produced by those councils and committees. And having been a former chair of the coordinating council, um, it was always, I always was surprised when there were folks that weren't involved in those councils. And I cut my teeth on it just way back due to a colleague slash mentor who dragged me to an ITE project through the Traffic Engineering Council. Um, so anyway, um, anybody else, any advice on how others could get involved in ITE from a council or committee perspective based on your own input? I gave myself up earlier as involved in one, so I can start. Um, I stumbled into uh, the Sustainability Standing Committee as a student um, and showed up to a couple, I think the first meeting at a conference and um, they are pretty small, they're not intimidating. Um, or there are some larger ones, but this particular one was fairly small. Um, so I wasn't walking into a room of 50. Uh, but after a attending a few meetings, um, I had Ryan Martinson ask, hey, do you wanna be our secretary treasurer? And I didn't realize that was quite a longer commitment than I th thought it would be at the time, but I'm very grateful um, that I was encouraged and, and asked to 
take on that role. Uh, so for those who don't know how that works, um, you do roll into the vice chair and then the chair um, and those positions change every couple of years, but it's been a really great way to, um, you know, even if you're not a technical um, expert on the material, it's a great way to get to know other areas you may not be working in um, day to day, a great way to build connections, get to know more of the things IT is doing. Um, and then I do like to try to make a point to plug it to students um, so they can get involved. Um, it's a yeah, really fantastic talk if there are students on the call, a uh, fantastic way to get connected to industry members as well. Great advice. I can, I can jump in too. Um, I had a similar experience. I was going to my first international conference and got the email about all the standing committees and councils and just checked the box of a lot of them. And it turned out the public agency council chair was the county engineer for the county next to us. And so I just reached out so I'd have a friendly face. Um, we didn't actually know each other. Um, and he was like, hey, I'm looking for a volunteer to work on this project. And uh, I think Jenny said it earlier. It was like, now there's like no looking back. I've somehow ended up as the vice chair of the public agency council, which is fantastic. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, and then um, I'm also now the co-activities chair for the Illinois section, and I'm in leadership ITE this year. And so, um, I think there's a, a so many opportunities. I think you can get as involved as you'd like. I think, you know, you can work on projects, you can get involved in the executive councils, but um, it, it has been just a great way to, to network, to understand what's going on. Um, and it's a great resource, right? My boss asked me for a brief synopsis of the proposed changes to the MUTCD. <laughs> She's clearly not in transportation. And so I was able to reach out to someone I work with who's doing that on behalf of ITE and, you know, save myself the trouble of having to complete that review myself. And so um, I do think it's just a great resource. And for anyone who's considering leadership ITE, I highly recommend it. It's a wonderful program. Um, I've met great people. We're working on really exciting projects. So I'll put that plug in there as well. I'll I can add. use that. Oh. <laughs> I, was, I was, go ahead. Oh, okay. I'll just add a quick note. Um, Econoway, I, I just learned this morning that we have actually been a member of ITE early 70s um, and we started with the uh, the development of the NTCIP series of standards and then more standards after that but in addition to it being great to get involved in these committees on a personal level to build your own personal connections it's really great for your company too speaking from a privately held company um, because it really gives you a voice in the industry and it really keeps your company educated on, you know, what's going on in the industry and the direction that we should be focusing on. So I just wanted to add that also. All right. One last awesome. comment, Tracy, and then I think Pam has a question she wants to ask. Sure. I just wanted to uh, build on what Karen was saying about uh, leader, the leadership ITE program. I'm also a graduate of that and, and a member of the committee for the leadership ITE program, which is now run all by volunteers. So, so it's pretty awesome um, that the leadership of the or the graduates of the program are running the program now. It's very cool. Um, but as part of that, I worked on a project our group had picked to do a project on transportation and health. And that at the time was an initiative of ITE. And so we had the opportunity to kind of segue that. And I'm now the chair of the ITE, of the Standing Committee for Transportation and Health. Um, and it kind of just came to be that way. Um, so I think, I, I mean, but how did I get there in the first place was my boss um, or supervisor was like, hey, you're coming to this Tampa Bay ITE meeting with me and I'm the secretary and you're going to take notes. <laughs> <laughs> he was joking, you know, but he brought me to the meeting and just I think I would encourage everyone to do that is like bring people to the meeting with you um, because that will make a change in their life. And it, it is that little thing that gets you involved and it sets you down the path. And the next thing you know, you know, you're the president of the Illinois section and you're doing Illinois or you're doing leadership ITE and then you're on a leading a standing committee. 
Um, and, and who knows where that goes, right? But um, I guess we all do know where that goes, right? <laughs> you, you find something else and you become involved. But um, I, I think those opportunities, and like Karen was saying, just the ability to reach out to a network and say, hey, who knows this? Who knows who knows this answer? <laughs> help me help me find the answer to this. And and that for me has been really um, great, a great way to just be involved in the profession and learn and develop myself, but also get to develop others and uh, learn what everyone is doing. Because without that, I, I would know what Kim Lee Horn was doing and I would know what some agencies were doing around me. Um, but I think you can just really broaden your perspective of, of what, what is really out there. And I feel like a lot of us end up participating in councils and committees that maybe aren't the focus of what we're working on all the time because we want to become more involved in that thing and learn more about it. And, and we think it might be a gap and what what we're taught so um, just throwing that out there is just take that first step either bring someone with you if you're already involved or just say yes if someone asks you to do something um, but take those opportunities as they come because they will guide you and who knows what happens next <laughs> all right thanks Tracy all right Pam has one question that came in to her and I'm going to let her ask that question for our group Wonderful, Beverly, thank you. And thank you to everyone who has participated today and everybody who has um, had the opportunity to listen to all these really wise words from all of you. Um, early on in the um, discussion, we did get a question and um, I think it, it's it's an important one. It kind of changes the tone of the conversation a little bit, but you know, a lot of us, a lot of you, and I can share that have talked about um, you know how privileged we've been to um, have certain things happen to us throughout our um, career and uh, the question that came in is um, for either a, um, one of the Alyssa's or Sh um, Shilpa about um, resources for those who are trying to build a program for people of color in small towns and in rural areas um, this uh, Benita Murthy um, who sent in this question sees resources concentrated in larger cities and um, from um, those in small towns tend to be left out. Um, so would uh, someone like to field that question? Maybe Shilpa, do you want to start? Can you provide some? Um, yeah, sure. Um, from my perspective, it was, I got the connections through my school. Like, uh, it was through a job fair that I went to in grad school and I was able to make the connections. I was also a member of IT as a student uh, and ASCE. But um, that's a very good question because maybe that's something we can do from an ITE perspective is, uh, and maybe a STEM committee is to make sure that we're not just concentrating on urban areas, but also reach out to the rural areas and the school districts or the universities that are often overlooked. Um, I don't have an answer to it right away, but I think that's a great point that we should look into as uh, as an organization to make sure when we are including and providing equal opportunities to make these connections for the students. Thank you. I know we are at the top of the hour. Um, people need to run off to additional meetings as well as at me. I just, is there anybody else that wants to provide another quick perspective to that question? Or we could um, maybe address it um, in e-community. E -community. I, I would say I moderated the Western District Diversity and Inclusion session that was maybe last week, and we had representatives from other um, professional organizations on and I think there's some opportunities there to make some connections to help for us to make connections with other professional organizations that are um, for people of color and how do we form partnerships and I think it may be something we can discuss off during the profession uh, during the e community but there were some really great insights but Society of Black, Black Engineers had um, you know they said come to our meetings and also you don't have to be um, black to be a member of our organization <laughs> well, that was very you just think she it was just and they have conferences and they'd like to see engagement in different conferences 
Um, so I think if anybody, if that recording is still available, I think that's a really good um, uh, webinar to, to listen to. There have been links on the ITE community to that one. Um, but I think, yeah, I think there are some opportunities that we can investigate and that's probably a good discussion for the community. Yeah, I think um, that's available until the end of this month, at least. Yeah. Then we're trying to see what we can, how we'll, we can provide that information, yeah. So I can get the link and um, send it out to everybody. I believe the link will be extended through the end of May. And, and Beverly, that is a really good reminder that um, the Western District did a fantastic job with that series. I do recommend people um, taking, a uh, taking the opportunity to listen to those recordings. ITE um, International is also starting its own series of transportation equity sessions. The first one is next Thursday, I believe. Um, April 22nd, um, and that information is on our website as well. Um, but with that, we are a little bit, running a little bit late. I do want to thank everybody um, for joining today. Jenny, Beverly, Tracy, Shilpa, Persephone, Krista, Karen, and Alyssa, both of you, um, thank you so much. I, I learned so much from this about all of you individually, as well as um, career options, and I hope that everybody on um, who was listening did as well. Um, I hope you all have a good weekend and we will all be, I'm sure, talking to each other shortly. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.